Okay, so, I am just writing down the theorem statement of last time. F has an essential singularity at z naught if and only for every w So, says that uh, there is a sequence of numbers ever getting closer to z naught, such that as you take f on each one of those numbers, you get closer and closer to w. Now, what I want to, so what I want uh, to clarify, because we in the last two theorems also we saw a characterization of other types of singularities. To understand exactly what this uh, characterization means. So, in the first case which was removable singularity the characterization was that uh, there is a small enough neighborhood of z naught in which f is bounded right. So, which means that you look at a z naught here or let me pick a different color for this and then pick a tiny neighborhood which is uh, maybe distance delta such that uh, in this neighborhood the value f z is bounded by some constant c in this entire neighborhood even on every point in this neighborhood it is less than equal to some constant c. This is removable for poles the correct condition is that if you look at z naught and again in small enough neighborhood of delta then in this entire neighborhood Oh, is too. You cannot see. So maybe you can go there. So here, in this neighborhood, what we are saying is that if you take any, here we have to show that it's un, the characterization is that it's unbounded, which means that no matter what constant you choose c there is a small enough delta for corresponding to that constant so that inside this disk f of z is bigger than c everywhere right and the third one which is the topic of discussion today in this we are saying that pick any w then for all epsilon there exists delta and there exists z z minus z naught less than equal to delta which is z is within this disk and f z minus w is less than equal to epsilon. So, that is the meaning of this characterization that you can if you want to be epsilon close to w there is a small enough neighborhood 
of z naught where u will hit epsilon be epsilon close to epsilon close to or pick any epsilon pick any delta and then there is a z inside that delta disk where fz is epsilon close to w now these three are of exclusive conditions one is not equivalent there is no overlap between these two because this is saying that inside a small disk you can find very large value for fz as well as very small value for fz okay so this distinction are clear is it particularly this characterization so let's prove this now the proof goes very similar to the proof we had for the poles characterization so let's assume that there is a w so we'll prove the contrapositive there is a w such that w is never reached inside the delta neighborhood of z not right so that is w is not of this kind so what does that mean in this picture what it means is that there is an epsilon such that that is not good enough because suppose fz takes value somewhere on the complex plane then this condition will be satisfied because for every epsilon there is a delta you can choose a large enough delta so that that particular value is within the delta neighborhood what we want to say is that very in very very small neighborhood of z not you can find the value w or something close to w that's very important okay so if this doesn't happen for some w what does it mean it means that in a very if you look at a very small neighborhood of z not every point in that in that disk will be at least epsilon away from w that is there is a small delta such that and there there is a small delta there is a small epsilon such that in that delta disk every fz is epsilon away from w so that's let's just write it down such that there exists epsilon there exists delta and f z minus w is greater than equal to epsilon okay and now we'll show that of course f is analytic in the neighborhood that's given as a condition so now we are going to show that at z not f has a pole so f is not an essential singularity okay and as i said the proof is very similar to the last time so the way the proof goes is you define let g z to be 1 over f z minus and consider what can we say about gz inside this disk
what is the absolute value of g z inside this disk less than equal to epsilon 1 over epsilon not epsilon right which means G is bounded inside this disk. There is a constant 1 over epsilon, and at every point, the absolute value of G is at most 1 by 10 epsilon. Okay. And notice that G has a singularity at Z0 because Fz is undefined, Fz0 is undefined, so G Z is also undefined. So, there is a singularity at Z0, but because G Z is bounded, this is a removable singularity. Now, if G Z is removable singularity, which means that G Z naught is can be uniquely defined, and G is analytic inside this disk completely. Now, if G is analytic on this disk completely, G Z is of course uh, G Z naught is also bounded. Now, G Z naught may be zero or may not be zero. So, so let's say G let G Z be z minus z naught to the n h z with h z naught not equal to 0. If g z naught is 0, it is a 0 of some order finite order and that is what I am writing here. So, h z naught is certainly non 0 all right. Now, what is f just recall f is w plus 1 over g z and writing this we get this for g z oh for f and this equality holds inside that disk. Now, what can we say about f h z naught is not 0. So, 1 over h z naught is non zero is bounded. So, 1 over h z is therefore analytic inside the disk. So, f what is f z naught? It is a polar order n. Well, it actually may not even be a polar or pole of order n, because that will depend on uh, no, it will be pole of order n sorry, it will be a pole of order n, because this is this now the you can write 1 of h h z naught as a power series and then this is a gives you a Lorentz series with uh, the lowest or the minimum degree being minus n. That is under the proof. So, which means that if f has an essential singularity at uh, z naught, then it necessarily has this property that you can reach as you tend towards z naught you can reach any value that you wish, which is completely bizarre and wild behavior. It is kind of hard to imagine although we did see an example last time that e to the 1 by z has at least in these two directions you get two very different values. And in fact, you think little more, more about it you can you realize that you can achieve any value at least for e to the 1 by z in uh, you following a particular path. 
So, and these are the only three kinds of singularity that can exist, because the definition was exhaustive. Removable singularity was that all negative coefficients are 0, pole was that some finitely many coefficients negative coefficients are non-zero and essential was infinitely many coefficient negative coefficients are non-zero. So, that is the only these are the only three possibilities that can exist. So, we have covered all kinds of isolated singularities. The first one does not quite is, is a silly kind of a singularity. The last one is a bizarre kind of singularity. So, the middle one that is a pole is what we really understand at least classically as a singularity, because this essential singularity is something which is not found in real analysis. This is only found in the complex analysis because of this strange behavior. So, from now on we will not talk about essential singularities, because they are too hairy to analyze. And more importantly in our uh, subsequent analysis of zeta function these do not arise, which is a very fortunate thing. So, we can stick with singularities which are more manageable. And in fact, there is a, uh, a whole class of such functions which have only poles and removable singularities as their singularities. And this is these functions are called meromorphic. So, f is a meromorphic on a domain d, if on every point in d f is either analytic on d on that point or as a pole at that point. So, clearly this is a generalization of analytic functions, we are also allowing poles to occur inside the domain. And these are the class of functions we will be interested in, in fact we will even more or most of the time we will be looking at functions which are meromorphic over the entire complex plane. So, now that we have gotten rid of essential singularities and said that we are only focus on poles, uh, we already seen the examples of poles earlier, we have also seen the advantage of expressing now I can call it the meromorphic functions as a Lorentz series around the poles. Uh, so, there is actually one very very important usage of Lorentz series which uh, and singularity also, which <coughs> we will make use of extensively in our subsequent in fact, I am going to give you examples of this usage, which is really remarkable. And that is uh, for integration of functions. So, let us say, let us say we'll just write integration of keep switching between this. So, suppose f has a pole at 
Z naught in the domain D. Okay. Uh, so, let us write F Z as a Lorentz series. Z not. Now, this Lorentz series may not be valid over the entire domain, but it is valid under on the on some punctured disk, because it is a it is a pole it is an isolated singularity. So, that can puncture that uh, analysis and there is an analysis on which this is valid and this inside circle is just a point. And now, let us consider this integral. So, this let us say this is valid for less than equal to what is the value of this integral? Will it be 0? No, there is a pole inside. Okay. Let us use the fact that there is a Lorentz series expansion of f around this point. Now, we use the uniform convergence to swap the integrals with summation. A k of course, can be taken out and then inside we have z minus z naught to the k d z. Now, let us look at the integral inside what is its value for k greater than equal to 0 what would it be a 0 because this is a polynomial which is analytic in, in the entire disk and therefore by cauchy the integral will be 0 what about the negative powers what about say k equals minus 1 you will get dz over z minus z naught So, there is this infinite uh, sum of integrals. Look at the first one, what is its value? 2 pi i, 1 over 2 pi i. <coughs> what is Cauchy's integral formula? Cauchy integral formula is that value of the function inside a disk is 1 over 2 pi i times integral around the disk the function divided by z dz right and this is so the what is the function here corresponding the constant function so its value is always 1 so this integral is actually 2 pi i okay let's move on second derivative yes what is it 0 why that is right the value of the derivative of the function the first derivative f prime z equals integral f w divided by w minus z whole square d w so that is precisely that form it is the first derivative 
of function 1 well derivative that is 0. So, that is 0 third one they are all derivatives so, that is it now this is a remarkable fact that integral of a Lorentz series around its disk of convergence around a pole of course, around its disk of convergence is just this 2 pi i times a minus 1 just that one coefficient one term which defines the integral value no other term matters. Okay. And now we can use this to great effect. Okay, but before I use this, let's generalize this a bit. There are two poles inside of a function inside a domain. This is the case when the function has one pole in a domain. What if there are two poles? So here is the domain, and let's say there are pole number 1 is here ok let us this I have colors available. So, I can pole number 1 pole number 2. So, what about this some function f you can break into two loops like that. exactly. So, suppose I want to integrate this function around some closed region say this region this integral around this region is same as integral around these two regions fine because here is completely analytic so that integral is zero and you can shrink these two to integral like this So, which means that you take f expresses a Lorentz series around first pole look at the a minus 1 express it as Lorentz series around the second pole get that a minus 1 corresponding a minus 1 add them multiply by 2 pi i that is your integral value. So, as a result or as a conclusion of this what we get is the following theorem. So, before I define theorem let us define a notation which is called the residue of an meromorphic function at some pole z naught that is equal to a minus 1 which is the comes out of the Lorentz series expansion around z naught right and note that this also covers the case when there is no pole at z naught for f then you will have a power series expansion around this which means a minus 1 would be 0. So, then the theorem says let f have poles at z 1 z 2 to z t inside this domain d. change this to j. Okay. 
the integral of f around the boundary of the domain is just the sum of residues at all the poles of f multiplied with So, it is this theorem, the power of this theorem lies in the fact that it allows me to compute the integral of a meromorphic function around the domain very easily. Right, you just look at the poles, identify the poles, compute, compute the residue at each one of the poles, and that is the value of the integral. Do not have to worry about what is the contour and whether. Uh, how does the function behave over the entire region of the domain? Just the behavior at the poles is what determines the integral. But there is something even more interesting. See, if I know the poles of f explicitly, then this allows me to. Yeah, that's well. I'm already repeating myself. If I know the poles explicitly, I already said that this allows me to compute the integral. There are some very interesting examples of this. Let us take the simple one. Okay, who knows the value of this integral? This is a totally real integral x going from minus infinity to plus infinity. 1 over 1 plus x square. This is a classical integral. Tan inverse? Yeah, it is pi or pi by 2, one of this. Do you know how to integrate it? You sub do a substitution for x equal to tan theta, then dx is something, and then you do the integral and so on, right. That is one way of doing it. Let us do it through the complex integral analysis. So, the first step is to think of this as as not being done over a well this is certainly being done over integral uh, over reals but i'm going to change this and change the perspective and think at uh, as at least the x being taking value over the complex plane but i have to then see what is the region over which i integrate and here is uh, the region or the domain that i pick up this is a complex plane. So, let us identify two points large at large distance plus r to minus r and the region that I define is this and then a semicircle centered at 0 of radius r. So, that is the region that is my domain for this function. All right. So, uh, let us call this domain uh, D then I am going to instead of this integral I am going to consider this integral. Okay. What is this integral over this domain? Let's apply this residue theorem. We should be. What are the poles of one over one plus z square? Plus i and minus i. So, does any of these poles lie inside this half disk? plus i yeah r is large let us assume r is large because because we have to evaluate this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity we are going to send r to infinity at some point so uh, i lies inside this so there is just one pole around this pole what is the uh, lorentz series expansion of 1 over 1 plus z square. 1 over 1 plus z square of course, can be written as 1 over z minus i times 
z plus i right. One of the simple way of calculating this a minus 1 if you think about it and think in terms of Lorentz series you multiply uh, because it is a pole you multiply the whole thing by z minus z naught ok. Let us postpone this I will come back to this later let us first discuss computing the residues. So, let let us say f z is k going from minus n to infinity a k z minus z naught to the k fine. If n is 1 that is the simplest case of pole it is a simple pole at that point of order 1. Then the residue is a minus 1 and we get z minus z naught plus a 0 plus 1. So, the way to calculate residue would be let us take limit z going to z naught f z times z minus z naught sorry this is minus 1. multiply f with z minus z naught and take the limit as z goes to z naught you will get a minus 1 all other terms will vanish. The same trick you can apply for higher values of n, but the problem is that uh, let us say for example, if n is 2 then if you consider limit z minus goes to z naught f z times z minus z naught whole squared what do you get which is not the thing that you want you do not want a minus 2 you want a minus 1. So, what do you do take take a differentiation right once you have this you this is a minus 2 plus a minus 1 z minus z naught plus higher powers you differentiate this whole function and then take the limit and you get a minus 1 and now you can generalize this for higher values of n you just have to take a higher order differentials. So, that is the way to get it good. So, now come back to this example this is a oops. what is the order of the pole at z equals i 1 clearly. So, what is the residue then? you multiply this function 1 over z minus i times z plus i with z minus i you get 1 over z plus i and take the limit z going to i. So, we get 1 over 2 i. So, this is 1 over 2 i times 2 pi i so that gets you pi. So, this integral is pi, but this this is integral is not quite this. Now, let us split this that is to say consider the same thing in a different fashion. This is an integral which is of the kind we want it is over minus r to r with uh, this part being completely real because y is the imaginary part here is 0 in this on this line plus um, 
sorry, this is imaginary part of z is equal to 0. Right? Look at this, sorry, strictly greater than 0, well, okay, yeah, you are right, this should be strictly greater than 0. Okay. And look at the second integral. What I will do is this is the kind this is the integral that I want once I send r to infinity. This is the sort of the annoying integral which I do not want. So, any, any integral of the kind that we do not want you would like to send it to 0 as r's go to infinity. So, let us see does it go to 0. To check that, let us just take the absolute value of this. This is less than or equal to what is the absolute value of 1 plus z square? When you integrate, move around the circle of radius r. Well, this minimum uh, or the largest value it will take is 1 over r square minus 1, the largest absolute value. That will happen when you have hit the here the absolute value starts with 1 plus r square, and as you traverse it keeps shrink reducing, and when you come here it hits 1 minus r square or r or the in, in the absolute term it is r square minus 1. So, it varies between r square plus 1 and r square minus 1 and since we are interested in an upper bound we will take this smallest of these values which is 1 over r square minus 1 d z and now you can do the integral integral is at that is a half circumference that is pi r now when you send r to infinity Why is it r square minus 1? Oh, yes, you are right. Sorry, I made a mistake. Yes, this here is also r square plus 1, here it is r square minus 1. Here, because it is a r e to the i pi by 2, and when you take square, you get r square e to the i pi, which is minus 1. but you cannot go below r square minus 1. And so, the limit as r goes to infinity this integral is 0 which is very convenient, because then when r goes to infinity this is the integral we want and we know this is pi. So, in this very simple way you get the integral. You can try out more things like this, uh, but I want to give you show you one more example, which is something we will make use of later, uh, which is the delta function. Okay. So, let me define this. Or not the delta function, it is like a step function. you want function like this, it is 
it is equal to 1 between 0 and 1 and after 1 it just drops to 0 and stays at 0. So, this is a non differentiable curve um, and the question is can we besides this simple definition can we get a more let us say more nice definition of this in terms of some complex integral. And again it turns out that yes we can and using the same residue calculus. So, let me give you the definition first and then we will see why it is so. So, this curve is precisely given by this integral x integral of x to the s by s d s and the integral is on the complex plane at any c greater than 0 and along this vertical line passing through c from going from minus infinity to plus infinity. Any questions on this? C, C can be anything greater than 0, it does not matter. So, it does not matter where you place this line as long as it is on the positive x side. Why x to the s? x is a real number actually, s is a complex number yes. What is meant by this? Complex powering? Well, this ok, yeah, I should have defined it. x to the s is simply e to the s log x, that is how you define it. Okay, so we will prove it in the next class.